Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Are you happy? Well, there is a scientific measurement that can confirm how happy you really are. There are statistics to show that happiness practices in the workplace increases productivity, innovation, lowers sick leave, and reduces turnover. Dr. Alphonsus Obeyawana was a medical student in 1979 when he was awarded the National Research Grant and Smithkind Medical Perspective Fellowship. The task at hand was to develop an instrument for measuring human hope to detect hopelessness early on so assistance could be offered in time to prevent suicide. The grant resulted in the Hope Index Scale, which has been used by Fortune 500 companies and global institutions. He has taught and mentored medical students, resident physicians, nurses, and fellows in the art and science of caring and promoting happiness for themselves and for their patients. A physician scientist from Ohio, Dr. Obeyawana is the founder and CEO of Triple H Project LLC, an entity, an entity that trains and certifies happiness coaches. He is also a retired major in the United States Air Force Reserve. The happiness formula is a scientifically proven unit of measurement, the five-minute tool that can accurately identify and differentiate happy and unhappy people from various scales. But it's more than just a mathematical equation, and the good doctor will explain. Please welcome Dr. Afonsis Obeyawana. So happy to have you here. So you were born in the is it Benin Kingdom, which is now part of Nigeria. Your grandfather was a personal doctor to the king, and your dad was a teacher to the crown prince who would later become king. So how did this family dynamic influence you to become a doctor? Actually, it did not influence me. I realized the coincidence later on. You know, it's a British system in Nigeria. When you are 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, you have to choose whether you are going to the arts or science. And that was very traumatic for me because I love English literature, I love psychology, and I love chemistry and biology. So I didn't want to uh, devote myself to just one side of the art science spectrum. And so when I had a chance to come to the United States to visit, and the person that was my host, was an engineering student, but I saw him with an anthropology book in the summer. And I was asking, why are you reading anthropology book? He said, no, in United States, first degree, at least, you can take science subjects and also art subject. I said, for real? I called my dad, I said, I'm staying. And <laughs> that is exactly how I came here. And I was very interested in medicine um, I studied biochemistry and medicine. I was in a, a combined MD-PhD program. And uh, now I'm uh, using my time now to uh, develop and expand the literary side of me. I'm writing and publishing my scientific research findings over the years. So I'm a physician and I'm a teacher. Um, so in making the connection, I can see that something might be genetic in there. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And you have uh, been on several medical missions to developing countries to deliver free health care. So talk a little bit about those programs. Okay. There is a group called the Nigerian Physicians, Association of Nigerian Physicians in the Americas, in Canada, in the U.S., and in the Caribbean. And that organization has been there now for 30 years. And every year, we go to mostly Nigeria, but we also go to Ghana and other places um, to give free medical care. For one week or two, we take over a hospital and provide free care. Surgery, and we bring our own medicine, and mm -hmm. it's so rewarding. And many times, I do my testing there for my hope and happiness studies. Mm. And uh, it has been very, very enlightening and rewarding. Yeah. And I'm and a past president of uh, that association. Also, you have delivered around five, 4,000 babies. That alone uh, is kind of a huge impact on the world. <laughs> I, I would say close to 3,000. Okay. But what happens is that I deliver some by myself on my own, but most of this we are counting, I'm supervising the medical students and the residents, okay? But they are still working on that. And if there's an emergency, I'm there to to take care of, uh, of things. That's a lot so, of babies. <laughs> oh yes, and it has been very rewarding because every time I bring a baby out of the womb, my reverence for life, it, mm -hmm. it just, uh, get intensified um, because it's a miracle. Every baby that is born is a miracle. Yes, There's sir. so much that could happen and would prevent it, prevent it from happening. It's a miracle, <laughs> really. Every, every baby that is born is a miracle. Let's talk about the Triple H equation. How would you describe what that is? Triple H equation is an equation, a simple equation that says hope over hunger equals happiness. Like you were saying, when I was a medical student, in my third year, you rotate through different areas, through pediatrics, surgery, psychiatry, occupational therapy uh, section, when I was in psychiatry, I took care of two patients that had just attempted suicide. And the way those patients felt that today is just like yesterday and tomorrow is going to be like today and nothing is happening. It's not going to get better. Well, what's the use of, uh, of being alive? That's mm -hmm. exactly how they felt. Wow. And because hope is what the issue is, that's why I, I suggested to my mentors if I can do some research on hope. And, um, and they said, yes. And about a month or two after that, they called for papers nationally. The NIH and the Smith Klein uh, Medical Foundation called for medical students to do a research in a humanistic area, not about chemistry or, or biology, but in humanistic area for two years. And that's how I got the fellowship. And I developed the... the so the, have there the been other studies like field. that or is, yours the, or is yours the first? I I think mine was the first because... Yeah. Wherever, wherever I looked, I could not find even a good definition of uh, of hope. Uh, so I had to go around. But yeah. what happened, Debbie, is that that was in 1980, 1979, 1980, 81, when I graduated. A gentleman called Martin Seligman when he became the president of the American Psychological Association, 
it brought the movement on about positive psychology. Instead of psychologists just settling on being, being disease focused, they then wanted to help people on, on disabled people to get better in their life actualizations. Mm. And so happiness became a big deal. And I was saying, well, why are the psychologists not thinking about hope? Because yeah. hope is what is lost when people take their own lives. So how is hope and happiness related? Can you have one without the other? That's what I was working on. Uh, plus, I know that study I was doing with my students about the inborn human hungers. Mm -hmm. When I look at the three of them, they were very related in a fascinating way. It looks like hope was positively associated with happiness. When hope goes up, happiness goes up. And hunger, when hunger goes up, hunger now being defined as a compelling desire. It's not just hunger for food, a compelling desire. And there are five of them. We can get to that into that later on. Five inborn. So when I look at them, the relationship, the only way precisely I could document and express the relationship I saw was a mathematical one. Mm. That is hope over hunger equals happiness, which means when hope, when hope increases, happiness will increase. Mm. When hunger increases, happiness will decrease. And when hope is high, it depresses hunger. And when hunger is overwhelming, it depresses hope. And, and until then, there was no way of measuring happiness. And uh, we are doing all this thing about happiness. And uh, many countries want to use the happiness of its citizens as the barometer for mm -hmm. finding out how well the country is doing instead of using GDP. Yeah, that makes more sense. And the, UN, the UN is fostering that. But there is no way to measure happiness. Mm -hmm. And when I got this equation, and I already knew how to measure hope from my studies, started in medical school, then I devised a scale for measuring hunger. And when you get your hopes, your hope score, and you divide it by your hunger score, you get what we call the personal happiness index. And that is what would increase if your happiness increases, would decrease whenever. So now we have a way for the first time ever of actually measuring happiness. Yeah. And it isn't just about having money, having this, or where you're, where you, I mean, there's people in, in war-torn countries that could score fairly well on the happiness scale, I imagine. Ooh, is you take that right. moment, my grandparents were from Ukraine and, you know, what's going on there, but yes. listening to their president and other people talking, well, for most people looking at the bombed out cities, it might feel hopeless and the happiness scale must be under the ground, but they are so it's like you say, the determination and it's the hunger part of the equation that is driving them to. Uh, you are so uh, right. Yeah. So it doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter what your exactly. financial circumstances. Exactly. Yes. And that is what I am um, challenging. You know, there's a world happiness report that comes out every year. It's sponsored by the United Nations. Yes. And for the past six years, um, Finland has been called the happiest country in the world. But the way yeah. they are doing it, 
the way they are doing it is very flawed. Very flawed. Mm -hmm. The instrument they are using in measuring it is very flawed. And uh, so um, hopefully they will change and use the this happiness formula. Yeah. And for some people who who hear this, they're thinking, well, how important is a scientific measurement as opposed to looking in the mirror? <laughs> well, that is a very good question because you, the individual, is the only person that knows how happy he or she is. You cannot get a panel of judges and, and they line people up and then they decide who is happiest. You can do that for the most handsome person or the strongest or the richest person. But for happiness, um, it is the person, the individual who can tell you how happy they are. And that is a trick in this instrument. This instrument asks you the questions about your life. And, and you just record it as you live it every day. And that's how we get your hunger score and your, and your hope score. Okay. And so it depends on the individual. It's done subjectively. The only thing that I have changed now is that we I'm doing it subjectively and objectively simultaneously because let me just give you an example it is like you the doctor can take your blood pressure okay we call that objective index but you can also take your blood pressure if you know how to use the instrument yeah or if you use the correct instrument you the doctor can take your temperature with a thermometer and that is an objective. And they can ask you, do you have fever? You say, no, I don't feel feverish. That's subjective. But you can use a thermometer yourself, put it in your mouth, and prove that you don't have a fever. So you are doing it both subjectively and objectively, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's the key to this. Yeah. See, or weighing yourself. People ask you, how much do you weigh? You can say, oh, 150 or 200. And you can weigh yourself, stand on the scale and read it, and you can verify. So you can do it subjectively and objectively, simultaneously. According to recent Harris Poll surveys, only one third of Americans say they are happy. And and that seems like a deep systemic cultural issue. And I don't know whether that stems from country to country. What might play into something like that? Number one, I don't know how accurate their measurement is. Uh, Just asking people, how happy are you? Yeah. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every day you see people in the street, you say, how are you doing? Oh, everything is okay. Yeah. People say that. You know, so it's not just that. How happy are you? Oh, I'm very happy. Now, for me, I know my personal happiness index now. And I'm in the very happy zone. And I feel very happy. But I'm not flourishing yet. Okay, flourishing, I have to get more score to to be in the flourishing uh, range. Uh, and anybody else who has taken um, this Edo questionnaire, we call it, mm -hmm. uh, they can compare. Now, if I, if I get better, if I go to a, a coaching lesson, happiness coaching, and I get better, the only way to tell it it's not by asking me, how happy are you? We test it. We test my hope score and my hunger score. Mm -hmm. And the research all over the world, there's no way of comparing them because there's no accepted, universally accepted, valid mm -hmm. 
tool for measuring happiness. And this is what this promises to give. So that when you are comparing happiness study in the United States versus in Japan or in the UK, you are comparing oranges to oranges and apples to apples, not apples to oranges. So when they say one third are happy, it depends on how they are doing it. The studies that I have done with these two, I find that there are three categories of people in any cohort, in any, in any country that we've tested, in any community. People who have high hope and low hunger, people who have very high hunger and low hope, mm -hmm. and those people in the middle who have average level of hope and uh, a moderate amount of hunger. It depends where you are in those. Yeah. And in my study, about 25% will be in the very happy um, category. About 60% will be in the middle group. Uh, I love that your book also lists the sources of human hope. And it is true that people really need to feel seen and heard. Uh, but it isn't simple black and white equation. And you really dive deep into the book on this. It took because... five years to write this book, to gather the, the, the data to make the book what, what, why, what it is. I wanted to write a book. If you go to Google and put happiness book, you're going to get millions. The, the thing is, I wanted to write a book that if somebody wants to just learn about happiness yeah, and know all the parameters and know what it is and get it, they might have to go to some areas to expand on certain aspects of it. Because well, you do dive deep into it. It isn't just about, oh, well, this is this is the dictionary description of what hope yeah. and how, you know, it it is really deep. It's quite intensive, although it is a very easy read. So <laughs> it is a scientific, it isn't yeah. a scientific read, which I, I appreciate. <laughs> so I had a lot of help with that. You know, as, this, <laughs> as a scientist and a physician, we use uh, words that uh, would throw people off. Um, in fact, Debbie, for instance, this book, the original title that I gave it was The Mathematics of Happiness. Yeah, that would be boring. <laughs> and my, my agent told me, nobody's going to read this book. No, no. Mathematics. <laughs> so, Mathematics, forget it. <laughs> yeah. So that way we change it to the uh, happiness formula. Yeah. And because that's exactly what it is, the happiness formula. And it even goes into happiness coaching. All you have to do when you have this formula, how do you increase the hope and decrease the hunger of your client? That's all. It makes everything simple and delineates it so that you can see it. Because the suicide rates are so high amongst those who are 18 to 24, it seems like something that really any college could benefit from having a happiness coach. And certainly we know that there's organizations that bring in humor experts to kind of help lift their workplace uh, productivity. But a happiness coach is a little bit more probably, do they work as a group or work one-on-one -on -one with the people? As, as a matter of fact, before COVID, I used to uh, um, organize happiness workshop on university campuses before COVID. When COVID came, that was died down, and I've become even busier now, so I'm not doing that. Now, I still train, I teach and certify happiness coaches now to do it well. And before now, they have no way of measuring how yeah. well the client is doing. See, right now, you can test the client before you start the happiness coaching. 
And when you think you are finished, test them again and see if there's if, if there's increase in the in the PHI, the personal happiness uh, index. So that that's what this is about. Is it makes it um people were saying before, oh, happiness is too elusive to measure. And I'm saying no. It is because we didn't know how to measure it. That's why it appeared elusive. Yeah. Okay. If we can, if you can measure something, it comes alive. You can feel it. You can taste it. You you can explain it. Um, before thermometer was invented by Daniel Fahrenheit and another gentleman called Anders Celsius. Before they invented thermometers, body temperature means nothing. What I mean, body temperature? People will put their hand on their head just to <laughs> feel. I mean, so, but once there was the tool for measuring it, and we know to be normal, 98.6 Fahrenheit, <laughs> to be normal. The same thing with the scale. You can have two, 20 sumo wrestlers in a room. You can hardly tell who is heavier than whom. But you put them to stand on the scale, and you will see, <laughs> you will see who's heavier, how much yeah. they weigh. So that's what this Edo question here is doing. In any group, if we identify people who are happy, unhappy, very happy, very unhappy, languishing, or flourishing. Hmm. Just by the score. And we see a lot of help, like self-help books are big business. And there's experts and speakers who have endless lists of do's and don'ts because you're coaching this stuff. How would you measure? Okay. This is what hmm. I do. And what I teach my coaches that I train to do. The very first thing is self-discovery. Give the ADO questionnaire to your client. Let them take it and see where they are. Yeah. If the score is below one, they are in the unhappy range. If the score is above 1.0, they are in the happy range. But in the happy range, you got to have 2.0 or above to be in the very happy range. And 4.0 or above to be in the flourishing range. Hmm. And downstairs, <laughs> when you are below point zero point five, you are in the very unhappy range. Below one, you are on the happy range, but below 0 0.5, you are in the very unhappy range. And below 0 0.250, you are languishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's right there. So you just take, it takes five minutes to what would, what would some of the traits be of a person that is that low? Maybe suicidal? I gave an example of a young lady that had a score of uh, 0. Um, uh, 0.127. And I didn't even know what she came for to see me for. Irrespective of that, I sent her to the emergency room mm. and sent a note with the doctor to please admit this young lady and within 24 hours to get her a psychiatrist or a, or a clinical psychologist to see her. And the doctor measured her blood pressure. It was normal. Temperature was normal. And the pulse was normal. Hmm. In, spite, in spite of my handwritten note to, the, to that emergency room doctor, he sent the patient home. Oh, dear and gave her appointment to come to the 
outpatient clinic the following day. The patient did not show up. And we, we, my nurse and myself, we were calling. There was no answer. We later learned that she took her, her life. Wow. By swallowing. That's pretty powerful of an of an index, isn't it? So, so this is it. Because what I did is, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, they take your temperature, they take your blood pressure, and they weigh you, and they take your pulse. If your blood pressure is extremely high, let's say like three hundred over two hundred, which some people have. Mm -hmm the doctor will have to send you to the emergency room, regardless of what you came for, to see him or her for. And that's what I did with this young lady. Yeah. Because I was using the uh, adult questionnaire in screening my patients. All How you want awful for that patient, though, to be sent home <laughs> after you sending her there, though, right? Yeah, yeah, with a note. Now, you cannot really blame the doctor because no. emergency room, emergency room it's is crazy. for emergency, okay? Yeah. And the blood pressure was normal. The temperature was normal. The pulse was normal. But what she did, what the doctor did wrong is that she didn't really pay attention to my handwritten note. Yeah, I wrote there that her score in the Edo questionnaire, you know, puts her in the languishing zone. And that this wow. lady should not be allowed to go home. And she was sent home. Wow. So you mentioned, you don't have to get into too much detail, but you talk about the five-point personal daily routine. Can you kind of overview that for us? Okay. Those personal daily routine is... We come about it in terms of the five things you could do to increase your hope and also decrease your hunger. Okay. Um, because hope and hunger are just like the opposite side of the same coin. All right. Number one you have to know what your niche is. What is your calling? That's something you got to find out. Mm. You have a happy life. You got to know what your calling is. And it's in the book, how you find your calling. It's right there in the book. Once you know your calling, every day do something to advance that calling. That's number one. Number two, do something, no matter how small, to put a smile on somebody's face. These are just the minimum now. That's the things you do. Okay. Uh, then number, number three, you have to count your blessings. Mm -hmm. count your blessings you have so many blessings that if you count them you will see that you are actually better off than you think you are number five number four do something no matter how small to learn something new even if it's just Looking a new word up in the dictionary. Just to learn something. Do a puzzle. Something. This is every day now. Okay. But I will I will come to that. Then number four, number five, do something to take care of your soul. To advance your spirituality. And there are things you do that we tell you. And it becomes very custom made for each person. You see, when I say put a smile on somebody's face, for somebody, that might be the wife. For somebody, that might be the boss or an employee. You know, 
this can be, it's called PDR, personal daily routine. The coach will make one specific for you, customized for you, depending on your answers to the questions in the Edo, Edo questionnaire. So that, that is what you do. What I just told you now is the generic PDR, personal daily routine. But for each person, you have to find out what is appropriate for them. Those are very simple, even just the overview of it. I can say that just a smile, if you are on a bus or wherever you are in shopping center, just smiling at, at somebody, especially if they're homeless or if there's somebody, you don't know where they're on that scale, right? Yeah. Because you could actually save their lives just by smiling at them. Yeah. It's crazy. Let, yeah, <laughs> let, let, let your dad driver go first. Something simple as that. Just yeah. let the other driver go first. Yeah. Um, give a glass of water to your gardener. You know, just something. And you go to a hotel, you are getting in, the doorman is opening the door, and you wait and shake his hand and say, Thank you very much. Yeah. Let him be recognized. Be recognized and included. In well, those are things that'll help the world be a better place, too. It is. It is. Uh, I'm presenting at the World Happiness Foundation uh, in Costa Rica um, in early March. And that's one of the things we are doing. And Happiness your book is, is your... so important. Yes. Your book is available on Amazon. And where can somebody get the coaching for the happiness formula? See, that book is the first thing to get. The parts of it I've had on the internet that I give to my students. You know, of course, they have the code to go in there mm -hmm. and they read about it and all that. But now it's in a book. If you get that book, if you want to become a happiness coach, get that book and then come to me. And that's what it is. Coaching is an unregulated industry. Anybody can be a coach. There's no licensing. I put a very special and enriched chapter on how to be a coach. Mm. You just cannot be a coach because you heard of one or two exercises that scientists say make people happy and then now you now you are a coach no you can't be a happiness coach just using your own intuition and personal life experiences you have to know that it is an art and a science Thank you. It is an art and a science. Because <laughs> exactly. not and, everybody can be a coach. <laughs> exactly. And also, now, test your clients first. And when you say you have finished coaching, the client has paid you or whatever, or before you pay the, the last fraction of the money, test the, test the client again. Yeah. And let us see what happened to the personal happiness index. We should do that for ourselves too. Oh yes, definitely. Um, my happiness score, I don't know if I already told you, is 2.932. We do it to three decimal places. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very rarely would two people have the same score. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have a, a class of 100 people, it, it'd be unusual to get four or five people with the same score. Thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about this. I think hearing all what we just heard, it kind of gives us all hope. Your hope depends on you, what you do and what you think. And that's it's in this book. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. 
please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.